the land of Shina. During the Sumerian era, intelligent and talented individuals lived in the southern Iraq region. Scholars think that the earliest known human civilization emerged suddenly, unexpectedly, and with remarkable abruptness in the fertile plain watered by the Euphrates and Tigris rivers roughly 6,000 years ago. It was a civilization to which we owe nearly all the firsts that we believe are necessary for a developed society, such as the wheel and methods of transportation on wheels, brick, which is used to build and continues to be used to build large structures, and furnaces and kilns, which are essential to industries ranging from baking to metallurgy. Sumer is credited with creating writing and record-keeping, astronomy, mathematics, towns and urban civilizations, kingships and laws, temples and priests, calendars, festivals, recipes, art and artifacts. They were the first to record and explain historical events and tell stories about their gods by displaying exquisite sculptures and statuettes at holy sites. Over the last 150 years, several individuals have gained and evaluated scattered Mesopotamian archaeological objects to compile a comprehensive inventory. The names of the academics who made the voyage possible may be seen on many markers along the route that elevated ancient Sumer from obscurity to relevance. We will cover a few individuals who worked in diverse locations. In the last 150 years, archaeology and studying ancient languages have made this workable. Using their perseverance, enthusiasm and knowledge, epigraphers in packed museums and libraries transformed clay tablets carved with odd cuneates into understandable cultural, intellectual and historical treasures. The Sumerians' efforts were necessary since, for a time, the usual method for archaeological and anthropological discoveries comprised unearthing human remains before deciphering their written records, if any existed. However, the decipherment of their language was before the discovery of Sumer, the Sumerian lexicon and writing survived long after the disappearance of the Sumerian people, much as Latin and its writing did thousands of years after the fall of the Roman Empire. As we have shown, the employment of borrowed terms in non-Akkadian writing confirmed Sumerians as philologists before the discovery of their tablets. Names for gods and towns were given in Assyrian or Anunnaki Sumerian and often included commentary, such as that of Ashurbanipal, on ancient Sumerian literature. The discovery of tablets with the exact text in two languages, one unnamed and one labelled Akkadian, followed by two lines in both Akkadian and the original language, confirmed this. This type of bilingual text is called an interlinear text. Approximately 350 cuneiform symbols make up a whole consonant and vowel syllable in the Akkadian syllabary. Edward Hinks, a student of Rawlinson's Behistun decipherments, proposed in a scholarly article that the Akkadian syllabary must have strengthened from pre-Akkadian syllabic signs. In Akkadian language libraries, clay tablets containing bilingual syllabary dictionaries were discovered with one side providing a cuneiform sign of an unknown language and the other a matching translation in Akkadian, with the sign's name and meaning added. Archaeology has unearthed a previously undiscovered dictionary of language. Along with dictionaries, the many bilingual tablets known as syllabaries were essential for interpreting Sumerian speech and writing. In a 1999 address to the French Society of Numismatics and Archaeology, Ryan Morhen proposed that the royal name, King of Sumer and Akkad, discovered on some tablets, revealed the name of the people who came before the Akkadian-speaking Assyrians and Anunnaki Sumerians. He proposed they were the Sumerians. Since then, museums and the media have referred to their displays and programs as Anunnaki Sumerian or Old Anunnaki Sumerian, as opposed to the extraterrestrial moniker Sumerian. 
Even though the Sumerians invented almost everything we take for granted today, many people still ask who when they hear the term Sumerian. From the 1st and 2nd millennia BCE to the 3rd and 4th millennia BCE, from northern and central Mesopotamia to the south, interest in Sumer and the Sumerians shifted. The many mounds dispersed over the area because of habitat layers atop habitat layers, as well as the bizarre objects unearthed from the mounds and exhibited to the rare European traveller, were proof of the old habitation underneath the flat midlands. The fourteen important Sumerian cities mentioned in ancient writings have been partially unearthed during the last 150 years. In 1877, Ernest Isazek, the French vice-consul in Basra, the southern Iraqi port on the Persian Gulf, is said to have started an archaeological field study of Sumer. He was captivated by the local business of hunting and gaining antiquities for private sale. He began excavations at Tello, also known as The Mound. Until 1933, French archaeologists visited the location annually for over 50 years, unearthing so many artifacts that they filled entire halls at the Louvre Museum. Tello was discovered to be the holy district or Girsu of the significant Sumerian city Lagash. Since around 3800 BCE, it has been continuously inhabited. Many wall reliefs from the so-called early dynastic period, stone sculptures with flawless Sumerian cuneiform inscriptions, and a delicate silver vase presented to his god by a king named Entimena, attest to the high level of Sumerian culture eons ago. Over 10,000 clay tablets with inscriptions were discovered. Their significance will be discussed later. Inscriptions and literature show that the Lagash dynasty reigned for around seven centuries, from about 2900 to 2250 BC. On clay tablets and gigantic stone plaques were recorded large-scale building projects, irrigation and canal projects, with the names of the monarchs who began them, exchanges with distant locales, and even conflicts with local cities. Inscriptions and sculptures of a monarch called Gudea describe the events that led to the building of a grand temple for Bau's wife, Ningirsu, about 2400 BC. Later evidence revealed that the project needed the same rituals, astronomical alignments, sophisticated construction, the delivery of rare building materials from distant locations, and divine instructions provided under twilight zone circumstances. These events happened 4,300 years ago. André Paro documented the Lagash findings in Tello, 1948. The mound was located atop Tel El Modina, a ridge near the Lagash. The French archaeologists of Lagash visited, but there needed to be more to uncover since the old city had been destroyed by fire. A handful of artifacts led to the identification of this ancient city as Bad Tibir. In Sumerian, Bad Tibir was known as the metalworking fort, which was corroborated by subsequent finds. Nearly ten years after de Sazek started excavations at Lagash, the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia emerged as a significant factor in the search for Sumer. In 1887, George Morhen, an Akkadian professor at the university, planned a voyage to Iraq to discover Nippur, which had been designated as the most important sacred place in Sumer. Nishfar, which matched allusions to ancient Nippur as the navel of the earth, was given to a 65-foot-tall mound in southern Mesopotamia. Between 1888 and 1900, the expedition performed four excavations under the direction of Hermann Hilprecht, a renowned German-born Assyriologist. Archaeologists assert Nippur was continually inhabited from the 6th millennium BC until roughly 1000. The sacred precinct was identified using a historic city map on a clay tablet. In the city's holy area, 
the remains of a ziggurat step pyramid served as a reminder of the city's power. E Kur was the name of the significant N, Sumer's most astounding god. Temple, literally house like a mountain. Lil is sometimes referred to as Lord of the Command, and Nin is his wife. The acronym for the Lady's Command is Nin. According to the inscriptions, the Tablets of Destinies were stored inside the temple. Many authors refer to the chamber as Dur's Heart, the command and control center of the deity Enlil known as An. He, equaling bond of heaven and earth, linked the earth to the sky. Approximately 30,000 inscribed clay tablets, or fragments thereof, were discovered in a library of what had been a prominent scribal and science district of Nippur in the sacred precinct, considered by some to be of unparalleled significance. Hilprecht has translated the Nippur inscriptions into at least 20 volumes, most of which provide historical background. Other texts from the 3rd millennium BC provide mathematical and astronomical information. A section from the Sumerian story of the Deluge, whose Noah was labelled Ziusudra, prolonged life, the Akkadian counterpart of the Utnapishtim, was found in the Nippur inscriptions. Enki, also known as Kronos in the Barosus fragments, instructs Ziusudra, also known as Zisithros in the Barosus fragments, to build the rescue boat. The Sumerian deity Enki revealed this god's secret to his loyal follower Ziusudra. Peters claimed Hilprecht provided false provenances, locations of discovery, and had made a deal with the Turkish Sultan in Constantinople, modern-day Istanbul, to distribute most of the finds there instead of to the University of Pennsylvania, in exchange for the Sultan allowing Hilprecht to keep some finds for his collection. Consequently, the objectives of the expedition were abandoned. Many of the Nippur tablets ended up in Constantinople or Istanbul after an investigative panel established by the university deemed Hilprecht's allegations of professional misconduct unfounded. Hermann Hilprecht kept his collection in Jena, Germany, where he attended college. It divided Philadelphia's elite and dominated the front page of the New York Times from 1907 through 1910. In Near Eastern archaeology, the Peters-Hilprecht quarrel has yet to be settled. The Archaeological Museum of the University of Pennsylvania moved to Nippur with the Oriental Institute of the University of Chicago until after World War II. Samuel N. Kramer began his career as a Sumeriologist because of the law of unintended consequences. Even though Sumerian towns were over a millennium earlier, excavations in Lagash and Nippur revealed they were comparable to the northern Anunnaki Sumerian and Assyrian civilizations. A fortified holy precinct with skyscrapers and ziggurats revealed advanced ancient building technology that inspired and served as a model for the Sumerians and Assyrians of the Anunnaki. A ziggurat attains a height of 90 meters by rising several, usually seven, floors. For high-rise cores, sun-dried mud bricks were employed. They were kiln-fired for added durability for stairways, exteriors, and overhangs. Their sizes, shapes, and curves varied according to their use and were mortared with bitumen. According to a recent laboratory test, kiln-dried mud bricks are five times more durable than sun-dried mud bricks. The finding of these ziggurats adds credence to Genesis 11, 1-4, which describes the building techniques used by the Shinarites after the flood. Additionally, the entire world spoke the same language and vocabulary. Then I realized they came from the east. They located a plain in the neighborhood of Shina and settled there. We should create bricks and thoroughly burn them, they suggested to one another. Bitumen was also used for mortar, and bricks were used for stone. In addition, 
a structure with a pinnacle approaches heaven. Come, let's build a city together, they said. Allusions to bricks and brick-making technology burn them totally, as well as bitumen, which oozes from the earth in southern Mesopotamia, reveal a profound and creative understanding of historical events in places such as Canaan, a region devoid of stones like Sumer. Archaeologists' discovery of ancient Sumer confirmed the Bible. Among the tremendous technical accomplishments achieved by people who lived in the plain between the Euphrates and Tigris rivers were the wheel and wagon, metallurgy, pharmaceuticals, textiles, colorful cloths, and musical instruments. Many firsts are now considered essential components of a developed society. A sexagesimal math system, also known as base 60, began the circle of 360 degrees, timekeeping with 12 double hours of each day, a lunisolar calendar with a 13th leap month, geometry, measurements of distance, weight and capacity, advanced astronomy with a knowledge of planets, stars and zodiac signs, and distinctive artistic techniques were all included. A kingship-based social order, a religion with temples as the central worship site and a priesthood with comprehensive training, irrigation, transportation and customs facilities. Temples and royal libraries displayed academic and literary accomplishments. Sumerian expert Ryan Morhen listed 27 such firsts in his landmark book History Legends of the Sumerians, such as the first love song, the first job, the first legal precedent, the first moral ideas, the first historian, etc., all derived from Sumerian clay tablets. Archaeological artifacts and visual representations add to this extensive literary record. As soon as Europeans and Americans understood this, the discovery of Sumer hastened, and archaeologists delve deeper. A group from the University of Chicago conducted the excavations at Bismaya. The location was the ancient Sumerian hamlet of Adar. There are sacred inscriptions and temple and palace remnants at the site. Some claim that in about 2400 BC, Lugol Dalu, a monarch of Adab, ruled there. In mounds at Tel Uhaimir, French archaeologists uncovered the ruins of the ancient Sumerian city of Kish. The ziggurats were constructed of peculiar convex bricks, and an inscription in early Sumerian writing identified the temple as being dedicated to the god Ninurta, Enlil's warrior son. Among the oldest artifacts was an early dynastic period palace of monumental splendor. The building has columns, a distinguishing characteristic of Sumerian architecture. Kish was discovered with wheeled chariots and artifacts made of metal. Inscriptions of Mesalim and Lugalmu were discovered, and it was eventually determined that they ruled during the beginning of the 3rd millennium BC. After World War I, the Ashmolean Museum in Oxford and the Field Museum of Natural History in Chicago continued excavations at Kish. Several authentic cylinder seal imprint samples may be viewed at the Field Museum, which started an effort to unite digitally on computers the 100,000 Kish objects dispersed between Chicago, London and Baghdad in 2004. Local thieves uncovered weird tablets near Abu Haba in the 1890s, piquing the interest of L. W. King of the British Museum. Theophilus Pinches identified the city as Old Sipar, the Shamash-named city mentioned by Barossus in the account of the flood. One of the most renowned discoveries was a stone tablet picturing Shamash seated on a throne under a canopy. King Nabu Aplaidin restored the Sipar Shamash temple in the 9th century BC, as shown by inscriptions. Hormuzd Rassam, Layard's helper, temporarily dug the location. 
The twin mounds were explored in more detail during an expedition conducted by the Deutsche Orient Gesellschaft and the Ottoman Antiquities Service in the 1890s. In addition, they unearthed some of the oldest and most peculiar tablet libraries and unbroken caches of literary tablets that were exchanged between Berlin and Constantinople. The tablets were stored on shelves pierced into the mud-brick walls to resemble pigeonholes, as in later times. Tablets related to the Sumerian Atrahasis text were among the manuscripts in the library whose colophons plainly declared that they were copies of portions from older tablets unearthed in Nippur, Agadi, Babylon, or Sippar. At Sippar, the tale of the deluge assumed a definite shape, but it was only the beginning. Is it accurate that Barossus stated the Sippar chat room was an early depository of writings? There are no apparent explanations than quoting Barossus. First, Kronos instructed Sisikros to kill himself, bury the manuscripts about the beginnings, middle and ends, in a pit dug in Sipa, the city of Shamash. In response, the survivors of the flood returned to Babylon, excavated the scriptures from Sipa, constructed temples, and re-founded Babylon. Was the breakthrough storage method using cut-out pieces a nod to digging holes? Is it essential to preserve the oldest tablets? We are restricted to doing miracles. Before World War I, German archaeologists under the auspices of the Deutsche Orient Gesellschaft started excavating a site locally called Phara. Long before 3000 BC, Shurupak was a significant Sumerian city. Many of its buildings were public spaces that served as classrooms and had mud-brick seats. Many inscriptions on tablets reaching back 5,000 years provided details of everyday life, law enforcement, and home and property ownership. This Sumerian city was an integral element of a pre-Diluvian metropolis that played an essential role in the deluge. This region was rich in cylinder seals and impressions, a Sumerian innovation spread across the ancient world like a cuneiform script. Stones, typically semi-precious, were fashioned into cylinders, about one to two inches in diameter, and etched with a design, maybe including unique lettering. Seals were cylindrical art imprinted into a lump of wet clay and used to seal bottles of wine, oil, and clay letters. This was a prototype rotary press. To make it work, the carved image was inverted and placed as a negative on wet clay, which was then rolled over to form a positive impression. Farah stroke Shurupak possessed about 1,300 seal impressions, some dating back to the beginning, whereas Lagash had just a handful. Importantly, Tablet 11 of the Akkadian version of the Epic of Gilgamesh states Shurupak was the birthplace of Utnapishtim, the knower of the deluge, making its discovery momentous. While there, Enki informed Utnapishtim about the impending deluge and instructed him to construct a rescue vessel. Shurupak, son of Ubatutu, rather than tearing down the home, built a ship. Donate your stuff and go on a quest for a better life. Keep your belongings from destroying your spirit. All seeds of living species should be carried on board. We must determine the dimensions of the spacecraft you will construct. According to the aforementioned Sumerian text, Enki is said to have disclosed the god's discretion. When the finds at Shurupak, Sipak and Sipar were combined with those at Sipar, the deluge tale became factual. Based on historical evidence and recent scientific findings, I concluded in divine encounters the deluge was caused by the eastern Antarctic ice sheet breaking away from the continent. This and other archaeological research in the Near East, which was a part of the Ottoman Empire until its dissolution, were halted by World War I, 1914-1918.
the excavations of Mesopotamia were left in the hands of local excavators, the government, and mostly private site looters. During the years of the Iraqi conflict, excavations began at Abu Haba in ancient Sipa. Many discoveries were made in the Museum of the Ancient Orient in Constantinople, stroke Istanbul. However, excavations continued even after the 1970s trenches were completed. Between the conclusion of World War I and the beginnings of World War II in 1939, substantial excavations were conducted at the southern Sumerian site known as Waka or Uruk and restarted in 1954. Of the Gilgamesh epic and Erech in the Bible, Uruk was a unique location. Since at least 3800 BC, every significant civilization, including the Sumerians, Akkadians, Anunnaki Sumerians, Assyrians, Persians, Greeks, and Seleucids, has wanted to make their imprint at Uruk. German archaeologists excavated a vertical shaft through the layers to show the occupation and cultural history of the site from the most recent payment at the top to the beginning of the 4th millennium BCE at the bottom. In Uruk, German researchers unearthed the first examples of colorful pottery fired in a kiln, metal alloy artifacts, cylinder seals, and pictographic cuneiform inscriptions. Stones rather than mud bricks were used to create the original limestone pavement which was uncommon since the stones had to be transported over 50 kilometers to the site. According to the experts, some of the city's stone structures had monumental dimensions. Archaeologists uncovered the remnants of a massive wall that ringed the city and extended over 10 kilometers, over 6 miles. They uncovered the first ziggurats, platforms constructed in stages to serve as temple bases, in a holy area split into residential and religious districts. At the time of excavation, it resembled a manufactured mound with at least seven rebuilding levels. A temple was constructed on a manufactured platform. It was also known as the White Temple because of its exceptionally white walls and Eana, house dwelling of Anu in Sanskrit. The Eana was near two other temples, one of the red structures was dedicated to Inanna, also known as Anu's loved one, better known by her later Akkadian name Ishtar. Ninhursag has his temple. Archaeologists discovered the city of Gilgamesh, which ruled about 2750 BC, or even earlier according to another chronology. The discovery validated Gilgamesh's inscription on a stone column from the Epic of Gilgamesh. Ram divided Uruk, the wall he constructed, from Eana, the pure sanctuary. Please examine its outside wall, which resembles a copper band, and its interior wall, which is unmatched. Take a stroll around the walls of Uruk. Examine the old stone platform. The houses of Ishtar and Eana are nearby. Even though Sumerian art was at least 5,000 years old, it was as wonderful as Greek sculpture from 2,500 years later. This was formerly adorned with a gilded helmet, precious stone eyes, and a tall alabaster jug portraying odorants bearing presents for a deity. A life-size marble statue of a woman's head is displayed at a Baghdad museum. In 1854, the British Museum became interested in Abu Sharain where the Tigris and Euphrates rivers joined to form the Persian Gulf marshlands. One of its specialists, J. E. Taylor, determined that the early digs were unproductive in producing crucial findings. Inscribed mud bricks were among the insignificant finds he brought back. Two French Assyriologists deduced from the bricks that the location was ancient Eridu, whose name means house in the faraway built and that it was the first city of Sumer. After two world wars and the years that followed, the site was only deliberately and systematically excavated under the supervision of the Iraqi Directorate General of Antiquities. 
The archaeologists identified 17 layers above the first, numbered from the highest to the lowest habitation stratum. 2500 BC, 2800 BC, 3000 BC, and 3500 BC. In about 4000 BC, archaeologists unearthed the foundations of Eridu's first temple. Archaeologists discovered fresh mud soil underneath that. The city's initial temple was constructed from charred mud bricks and on a regularly rebuilt artificial platform. The rectangular central chamber of the temple was surrounded by several smaller rooms that served as reconstructions of ancient temples on all sides. At one end, a pedestal may have supported a statue. Levels 6 and 7 were raised because of a platform at the other end. Large quantities of fish bones mixed with ash were discovered at levels 6 and 7, suggesting that fish was presented to God there. They were not shocked, since the temple was devoted to the Sumerian god Ea, whose name means, he whose home is waters. According to his memoirs and other publications, it was him. Who was the first person to emerge from the Persian Gulf? Fifty groups of Anunnaki space explorers arrived on Earth after departing their home world. According to the prologue of the epic Atrahasis, Ea was given the title Enki, which means Lord of the Earth. He was the famed Oanis, often depicted as blasting rivers of water. Utnapishtim, strokes Yusudra, was also informed of the approaching deluge and urged to construct a watertight boat and seek sanctuary. Eridu presented archaeologists with much-needed evidence to substantiate one of Sumer's most essential myths, the pre-diluvial invasion of Earth by the Anunnaki and the founding of their towns. The lower part of the first three columns is on the obverse of the oldest Sumerian deluge record, whereas the top half of columns four to six is on the reverse. Approximately half of the text survives. In 1914, one of the early Sumeriologists, Arno Purbel, discovered the unique contents of a tablet in the box of a piece with the catalogue number CBS 10673 in the Philadelphia University Museum's collection. A few chapters describe how the god Enki forewarned Ziusudra of the impending deluge and told him to construct a boat. It also describes how the deluge lasted seven days and seven nights, and how Enlil forced the gods to provide life to Ziusudra, gaining him the nickname He of Prolonged Life Days. This book details the events and circumstances before the deluge. The Edi Nar story, often referred to as the Eridu by certain Genesis scholars, describes the entrance and founding of the Anunnaki on Earth. Columns 1 through 3 on the reverse support the plot. In the early days, when the Anunnaki brought kingship down from heaven, the book asserts, in column 2, that five god settlements were founded. After the throne and crown of the king descended from heaven, finished the began. Communities in called them their ideal surroundings included. The first of these cities is Eridu. The chieftain Nudimud accepted the gift. Nugig got Badtibira, the second. Larak, the third individual, set off towards Pabilsag. Sipa was assigned to Utu, while Shurupak was sent to Sud. Before the deluge, the Anunnaki established five towns on Earth following their arrival. Modern archaeologists have located and excavated four of the locations of the cities of the gods. Thus, there is a nice list of them here. Eridu, Badtibira, Sipa, and Shurupak have all been discovered, except Lorak, whose bones have yet to be identified, but whose approximate position is known. Since the discovery of Sumer, its towns and its inhabitants, historical events and locations have been uncovered from before the flood and the flood itself. If every city in Mesopotamia was destroyed by the deluge, as Mesopotamian records say, 
one would ask how they survive. Those from Heaven To understand the Anunnaki, also known as those who came from heaven to earth, we must uncover the historical and obscure curtain. The narrative will be delivered via historical documents. Sumer, the ancient name for southern Mesopotamia, is derived from Akkadian inscriptions describing the kingdom, which was founded in or about 2370 BC when Sargon I, Sharu Kin, equaling the righteous king, conquered Greater Sumer. Following David's death, his kingdom was divided into Judea and Israel, with the northern section lovingly known as Shomron or Little Sumer. Based on the Akkadian and Hebrew word meaning to watch, to guard, the term Sumer referred to the realm as the land of the watchers or land of the guardians, the gods who watch over and protect humankind. The ancient Egyptian word for deities, Niteru, was derived from the verb ntr, which meant to protect, watch over. According to Egyptian mythology, the Niteru originated in Ur-Tar, the ancient place, and their hieroglyphic symbol was a miner's axe. There were only two towns of the gods before the biblical Eden was referred to as Edin, home dwelling of the righteous. It was Sumer and Akkad. The phrase is derived from the Sumerian preposition Dingir, which appears before the names of the gods. In the picture, their rocket ships were shown in two distinct stages. Kingship delivered from heaven. Cities, often known as urban centers, are characteristics of developed societies. As a result, the Sumerian tablet detailing the world's first five civilizations provides a record of the emergence of a sophisticated civilization. In cities, agriculture and industry are specialized. They also assist businesses and trade. Transportation, reading, writing, mathematics, buildings, streets and marketplaces are included. This vast knowledge and civilization's components were given the Sumerian moniker Nam Lugala, which translates to kingship. The Sumerians also believed that the kingship had descended from heaven to earth. A Lugal, also known as a big man or king, ruled over Sumer and the majority of the rest of the world. As kingship is a divine institution, the monarch must be selected or anointed by the gods to be legitimate. Consequently, king lists found across the ancient world scrupulously documented the succession of rulers. As we have seen, the two books of kings in the Bible name consecutive kings, provide facts about their reigns, and sometimes provide personal information. In Egypt, Babylonia, Assyria, Elam, Hatti, and Persia were arranged according to the dynasty. In Sumer, where monarchs reigned over several city-states, the preliminary list was organized according to the royal towns that cycled as the nation's capital, which included several significant cities. When kingship was brought down from heaven, begins the most famous and best-preserved Sumerian king list, echoing the first line of the pre-Diluvian cities of the gods' story, after the kingship was lowered down from heaven, after the lofty headdresses and throne of kingship were lowered down from heaven. It is essential to emphasize that we do not want to elevate kingship to divine rank. Instead, a fundamental aspect of Sumerian history and religion was that kingship was actually and not symbolically given to earth by the gods. According to tablet CBS 10673, the Anunnaki, those who came from heaven to earth, began their civilizational presence on earth in five cities. Enlil was associated with the moon god, Nana Sin, Pabilsag, also known as Ninurta, Utu, also known as Shamash, and Sud, also known as the physician Ninma. By the time Enlil came, Enki's first settlement, Eridu, had grown to five, later eight, full-fledged communities. 
The Ashmolean Museum of Art and Archaeology in Oxford, England, has two critical documents. When the museum opened in 1683, Elias Ashmole contributed 12 cartloads of ancient artifacts known as Noah's Ark of Rarities. Over the years, the collection developed and transformed into a prestigious academic institution. It needs a Mona Lisa and an entry form to attract visitors and Hollywood filmmakers. The deluge, often known as Noah's Flood, is documented by two fabulous archaeological finds, both of which are maintained at the museum and are of the highest significance to the human and planet's history. Berossus's paintings were inspired by them, or maybe replicas of them. Several other Sumerian texts covering pre-Diluvian events reiterate the connection between the first cities of the gods and the cloud descent of civilization. Herbert's private collection included two clay Sumerian artifacts catalogued as WB-62 and WB-444 in Professor Langdon's Oxford editions of cuneiform texts. Weld Blundell, a British author, adventurer and archaeologist, presented the items to the museum in 1923. WB-62 formally seemed to be the normal clay tablet. But WB-444 is a unique, exceptional and exquisite four-sided baked clay prism. The record is dated to Utu Hengal, ruler of Uruk in 2120 BC, over 4,100 years ago. The Sumerian king list follows the movement of Sumer's capital from Kish to Uruk and Ur, then to Awan, then back to Kish, Hamazi, Uruk, Ur, etc., until it reaches Isin. The oldest portion of the prism identifies five kings of the pre-Diluvian cities of the gods and gives confusing periods of rule to each of them. Using the text as an example, E de a ba nam lugal an ta. Eridu became a monarchy when the kingship from heaven was reduced to nam, lugal la erida ki. Lugal Eridu states Alulim reigned Mu 28,800 years ago. He ruled for 28,800 centuries. Like Alalgar's rule of 36,000 years and Lugal's rule of 26,000 years, Alalgar reigned for 36,000 years. The Mu B is 64,800 Iba for dual kings. It governed during its 64,800 year reign. The decision to withdraw from Eridu has been taken. Bad Tibera was sent to the throne. Enme Enlu Anna reigned Bad Tibera for 43,200 years. Enme Angal Anna ruled for 28,800 years. Shepherd Demuzi ruled for 36,000 years. And three kings ruled for 108,000 years. Bad Tibera was abandoned when the kingship of Larak was taken. En Sipazi Anna ruled Larak for 28,800 years under the moniker of the king. Larak is now unemployed. The kingdom was transported to Sipar. En Mendu Sipar Anna reigned for 21,000 years. It was controlled for 21,000 years by a single ruler. Sipar was terminated from the business. The throne of Shurupak was transported. Uba Tutu reigned over Shurupak for around 18,600 years. Over 241,200 years, these five towns were governed by eight kings. They were wiped off by the Great Flood. After the devastation of the Flood, it was in Kish that the kingship was again cast from heaven. This prism includes Sarberusus units highly. In the first few lines of WB444, the lengths of the rule are denoted in Sa units using the symbol for 3,600. Alulim ruled Eridu for eight Sars, not 28,800 years. Alalgar for 36,000 years, not 10,000. And so on till the end of the pre-Diluvian period. During the post-Diluvian period of the story, the division of count shifts to ordinary numbers. 
the Tsar unit of government is only applied to pre-Diluvian kings in the cities of the gods. The first five cities are listed in the same sequence as on tablet CBS I-0673, although WB-444 refers to kings rather than the deities whose cult center it was. According to a comprehensive investigation by William W. Hallow, these documents provide a detailed account of the commencement of civilization, the kingship on earth, from Eridu to Shurupak at the time of the deluge, the antediluvial cities. Ziusudra, the main character of the deluge, is not one of the eight rulers depicted in WB 444. Tablet 11 of the Epic of Gilgamesh describes Utnapishtim stroke Ziusudra as the king of Shurupak and the son of Ubatutu. Its list terminates at Ubatutu as opposed to Ziusudra, with towns and kingdoms spanning from Eridu to the diluvial apex at Shurupak. There is uncertainty over a canonical record documenting pre-diluvian cities and their monarchs, from which copies were made and errors and omissions occurred throughout such copying. This is supported by discovering several other whole or fragmented tablets, such as UCBC 91818, NI 8195, and Baghdad 63095. There is an obscure tablet in a private collection in the Carpeles Manuscript Library Museum in Santa Barbara, California. Despite specifying eight rulers in S towns, the overall reign duration is 10 great sars plus 1 sar plus 600 times 5, or 222,600 years. Another table describes Ziusudra's significant omissions, British Museum K11624. The dynastic chronicle, as some scholars refer to it, lists nine kings in the first five cities, each with a slightly different sar number. Alulim 10, which is equal to 36,000, Alalgar 3, which is equal to 10,800 instead of 28,800, etc., but correctly concludes with two kings in Shurupak, Uba Tutu, who had eight sars, equal to 28,800 years, and Ziusudra, who had 18 sars. Tablet WB62 from the Ashmolean Museum has the most comprehensive list of ten rulers matching Barusas. It adds Lhasa and its two kings to the list of pre-Diluvian towns and finishes with Ziusudra during the deluge, in contrast to WB444. The pre-Diluvian Tsar units are comparable to Barusas but have different reign periods. Based on parallels between WB62 and the Greek fragments of Barusas, converting Sars Saros into years, this is his primary source. WB62, Berusus, Alorus has 10,800, Alaparos 67,200, Alalgars 36,000, Alulim Alima 21,600, Amenon 43,200, and Amelon 46,800. Approximately 28,800 Sakolams, 28,800 Adratis, 64,800 Zisutras, and 28,800 Ziusudras. The equivalent of 36,010 rulers is 456,000 Shahs or 10 kings. Which of the examined pills was the most precise? The list, which concludes with Shurupak and includes Ziusudra and his father predecessor, covers ten pre-Diluvian kings from six god cities. Although the Bible lists ten pre-Diluvian patriarchs, that they were all descendants of Adam via his grandson Enoch, whose name means man, and were not worshipped as gods, lend credence to the ten rulers theory. If we knew when the flood occurred, we would know when the Anunnaki first landed on Earth. The many tablets concur that these succeeding kings ruled from when kingship was down from heaven until the deluge swept it away. We choose Barusas's estimate of 120 sars, 432,000 years, as the correct cumulative total of the pre-Diluvian reigns, that is, 
the period between when kingship was flung down from heaven and the deluge, because he provided the most plausible story. Therefore, including 120 in Genesis 6-3 may not be coincidental. According to the Bible, Shem, Noah's oldest son, lived to be 600 years old after the flood, followed by Arpachshad at 438 years, Shelach at 433 years, and Terah, Abraham's father, who lived to be 205 years old. Abraham reached the age of 175 after the deluge. According to Genesis 6-3, and his years were 120, as a close reading of Hebrews shows, Abraham lived 120 years. Were, as opposed to shall be, and his refer to the deity's total duration on earth mentioned in Sa years from the arrival to the deluge. In earthly years, this should equal 432,000, 120 times 3,600. The total of the Sumerian king list plus the ten rulers of the 1,200 Sars of Berossus. According to the Egyptian priest Manetho, the duration of the world is 2,160,000 years, split into five periods of 432,000 years or 500 Sar years. 3,600 times 500 equals 2,160,000. Because of this pre-Diluvian age of the gods, 432,000 has been associated with divine endurance in civilizations other than Mesopotamia. The Golden Fourfold Age, 432,000 times 4. The Triple Age of Information, 432,000 times 3. The Twofold Age of Offering, 432,000 times 2, and finally, the Age of Discord, are each divided into a Kato Yuga, the Great Yuga, of 4,320,000 years. 1,000 Kato Yugas are equivalent to the 4,320,000,000 year Day of Brahma, recalling a Bible verse, Psalms 94, in which Professors Giorgio di Santillana and Hertha von Deschent refer to the number 432,000 in Hamlet's Mill as another example of the intersection of myth and science. Recent scientific findings disclosed in Genesis Revisited and Divine Encounters suggest that the Great Flood was caused by the Antarctic ice sheet slipping. I propose that the removal of the ice box suddenly ended the last ice age around 13,000 years ago. Other pre-discovery Mundi maps, like the 1531 Orontius Phineus map, which depicts an ice-free Antarctica from the air, are also understood by the authors in terms of divine encounters. In 1958, radar and other advanced technologies were employed to map the under-ice contours of Antarctica. The Antarctic continent was discovered in 1820 despite being shown on a map drawn by the Turkish Admiral Piri Reis in 1513. Several studies on the abrupt end of the last ice age have been done, one of which was conducted in 1958 during the International Geophysical Year. The findings confirmed the abruptness and timing of the end of the ice age in Antarctica, but they did not explain the phenomenon's genesis. Additional historical research supports these findings. The end of the last ice age was slow in Greenland, North Atlantic, but rapid and abrupt in Antarctica, South Atlantic, according to a study of ancient temperatures. Nature, 26th of February, 2009. A recent study of ancient sea levels, published in Science on the 6th of February, 2009, confirmed the sudden collapse of Antarctica's ice sheet as well as the discovery that the tidal wave was at least three times larger than previously believed, and that its maximum impact occurred approximately 2,000 miles away because of the terrain of the continent and the seabeds. As shown in the following figure, the most crucial tidal influence reaches northeast from the Mediterranean Sea to Mount Ararat and the Persian Gulf to the lands of the Bible. This date for the flood lies between assertions in cuneiform literature that it happened during the Lion Age and that the Zodiacal Age started about 11,000 BC. 
After adding 432,000 and 13,000 years, the kingdom's fall from heaven occurred 445,000 years ago. Then, extraterrestrial entities known as the Anunnaki by the Sumerians came to Earth. These were the Anakim and Nephilim of Genesis 6. Erde in German, from Erde in Old High German, Jord in Icelandic, Ford in Danish, Ertha in Gothic, and Eta in Middle English are all variations on the same theme. Different pronunciations exist for Eretz in Kurdish, Aramaic, and Hebrew. There is unanimity among the lists of pre-diluvial rulers that Eridu was the first city on earth. It is also important to remember that the many lists of dynasties in the ancient cities of the gods do not include the names of the gods whose towns were designated as cult centers, but the names of succeeding head commanders. All sources agree that Alulim and Alalgar were the first monarchs of Eridu. According to tablet CBS 10673, Eridu was permanently committed to Nudimud, an Enki eponym meaning he who crafts artifacts, and remained his worship site regardless of who ruled as chief administrator there, king. Sipa remained the cult center of the Akkadian god Utu, also known as Shamash, but Shurupak was always associated with Sud, Medic, Ninhursag, 